Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jade, and this is How to App on iOS. And today, I get to present to you the Russ 8889 documentary. Disco to Dog Tracks. So strap yourselves in for the next hour or so. Whoa. What's going on? I've got, I've got, uh, I've got video playing in the background. That's how unprofessional I am today, folks. Welcome aboard. My name's Jade. This is How to App on iOS. Um, and today it was meant to be yesterday, but um, unfortunately, unforeseen circumstances, which revolve around a couple of things. Uh, my health, uh, firstly, is uh, not in a good way. I'm just going to say that. I'm not going to go into it. So over the coming weeks, there may be more disruptions ahead. Um, it is what it is. Um, and uh, there was another issue that uh, happened uh, to stop yesterday's show. This show going ahead was that uh, we had a massive storm here on um, was it th Thursday. Thursday, and we had a huge lightning strike that hit very close to our house and it fried my modem, uh, rendering my internet completely dead. <laughs> and um, we couldn't get, the, the modem was fried. So yesterday, uh, while I was dealing with some pretty bad health issues, I had to get a new modem and get everything set up and here we are, we're back. The internet's working Touch wood, touch wood. Everything stays good. Um, but yeah. So uh, thank you for your patience and thank you all for the very kind wishes um, on all the social media. Uh, it was really kind of everybody and sorry if I scared you all. I couldn't respond. I had no internet to respond to everybody. Um, and then I got a lot of messages after the internet came back on. Uh, it is, is what it is. So yeah, let's going forward. I, uh, there may be shows get cancelled as we go forward with uh, certain health stuff that's going on, but it is life. What can you do? So we're going to push through today. Uh, thank you all for your patience. Now, Russ sent me this. Russ told me about this uh, about a month ago, probably a little over a month ago, that he was working on a documentary. Uh, a, a story about his musical history and the music that interests him and and how he got to where he's got to. So um, we decided to do this, uh, premiere this on my channel because I love premiering Russ's stuff. You know, I love Russ so much. I love sharing his stuff. So that's how this came about. And he did a bang-up job with his, uh, with one, his one arm putting up a green screen and putting together this this documentary. It's really it's very impressive. I, I would have loved to have seen the behind the scenes of him putting up a green screen uh, just for comedy. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Let me call out some names and then we'll get down and play this thing. He is all right for a twat. Absolutely cold acre. Uh, he's a little bit shaky. So cold acre, hello, Russ. Hello, Scott Borthwick. Hello, Thomas. Mr. Smith, Joe Glenn, Princess, Mamsie Graham, Leela, Patrick, if you missed out on my premiere at the, a little while ago, about an hour ago, I premiered a cover of the Chandler Brothers, good fun, it's a great song, Audible's here as well, Fat Panda Cat, hello to you, uh, who else have I missed? Andrew Jackson, I think. Andrew Jackson Music. Hello to you. Jim Shannon on Sounds. I'm kind of glad I'm getting to sit back today and not do anything uh, because, yeah, I'm already tired after doing this <laughs> intro. <laughs> Helen Fred Fumbler. Um, hello to you. I already said Cold Acre. I'm scrolling up to see if I missed Patrick Chandler. There's Patrick. 
Um, who else? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Alex Backus, hello to you. I think I've got nearly all of you. Gregory O'Sullivan's there as well. Um, anyone else I may have missed? I think I got you all. I think I've got. If I've missed you, let me know. Hey, Rock Hard, Rock Hard Music. Good to see you. Hi, Kim. All right. Um, let's get on with this so I can kick back and not sit here blabbering. Um, just going to have some water. Wow. And it is so hot here. Hello, Prin uh, I said Princess. Hi, Valerie. Great show, Valerie. Just finished your live stream. Before I do uh, go on, I can let you know, so anyone who's been following the channel knows that I did a bunch of YouTube ads this week, last week, on my two of my videos, one of my videos. Boy, did it go off. I can report now, Metheus, the video clip that I put Google ads on, at this point has 1,547 views compared to 48 before Google ads. So we'll talk about that during the week, though, but uh, I thought I'd give you an update on that. Boom, went off. All right, so let's get into it. This is Russ's documentary that he's put together all by himself. It is called Disco to Dog Tracks. I'm going to take a back seat. I'll be putting your comments up on the screen. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, again, thank you to all the kind messages from everybody over the last day. Uh, it's been really nice. Um, thank you for all your support. Let's do this. Let's do this video. Um, I've seen it. It's really cool. It's uh, lovely stuff. All right, let's do it. Boom. I'll see you on the other end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's a bit of self-indulgency tonight. I'm gonna talk about um, the kind of music that I've listened to through the years, what's influenced me in making the music that I make today, uh, the musical journey that I've been through from you know, buying my first record at seven years old, which was uh, Crawford Autobahn, and how that electronic music kind of really took me in. Um, I then got into films like Grease, um, Saturday Night Fever with all that kind of funky disco stuff. Obviously all the stuff that was played on the radios at that time during the 70s up until the 80s again, where I was listening to um, the local radio stations and BBC Radio 1 mainly. Um, they would have been the big music stations of the day and I would have... Um, I would say that, you know, they were the big influencers behind my listening to music and having a brother that's five years older than me listening to music that was coming from his room. So from a young age, I can remember having music centre with a record player, a cassette deck and a radio that was built in one. And I used to pause out all the adverts on the gaps in the radio and then get a little microphone and plug it in and actually sort of DJ my own vocals, well, not vocals, but talking over the top, introducing the records. So from a young age, I've been heavily influenced by music. And then in the 80s is where it really started to kick in, where I started to, you know, do things to earn pocket money so that I could actually go and buy music. And I, you know, having my cousin who was a little bit older than me showing me stuff and like playing stuff on his guitar and then like, stuff that was coming out of my brother's room and like going 
through the stages of like getting my own way through music what I actually like so hopefully you enjoy it and it will show in some of the music that I play tonight what kind of uh, music has influenced me through my journey in music and to the music that I'm making today. Craftwork had been a big influence to me as it was my first record that I ever bought. I then got into a sound that was called Electro and that was a bit like Craftwork but speeded up. These are some of the records that I was buying at times between 1981 and 1986. So from the ages of 11 to 16 I was into this electronic hip-hop uh, music and I was spending my weekly pocket money buying these records so for every birthday every Christmas I'd asked if I could have money so I could buy records and I used to record the records on the cassette deck and I would take the cassette out and every weekend me and my friends would either use a piece of lino or a piece of cardboard and meet other kids on the street corners and do break dance battles. So that's kind of what I'd done at that time and that's what really got me into music because everyone liked the fact that I would have the latest kind of records. So I used to record a show called LWR it was with a DJ, Tim Westwood, and he would play uh, the hip hop and electro show from like two till four in the mornings on like a Wednesday night or so. And, it was. Jumping. and I would wake myself up with an alarm clock and record all the latest tracks to hear what the new kind of hip hop tracks were that everybody was listening to. So I would then pick a record out of them and maybe buy one or two of them a week. And that's how I started collecting records.
So I'm going to start this journey off um, from the disco time, from the 70s through the 80s. That's when I was born in the 70s, so that's when I picked up on it. Obviously, Dance Music Origins has, you know, a long history before that, but that's where I'm going to pick this up from. So disco really got um, big and formed because there was, I think, the first kind of disco-y record to use them classic sounds was uh, She's a Winner by The Intruders. And there was uh, another French band and they released a distro, uh, disco track called uh, Sol Makusa or Sol Makassa. Um, I'll probably butcher the name. <laughs> but um, this spawned clubs in Italy, little clubs, and then there was a famous club in New York called Studio 54. And that's really um, the turning point from the traditional sort of going out drinking club to an actual nightclub that was banging loud music and there were DJs spinning records and actually putting one record on after the other. And this really spawned uh, a whole generation of like the DJ is what we know today and how clubs were really formed. There were other clubs around, but this was the one that got all the uh, noise and all the thing. It was a big uh, party time in New York. So this really captured on and then there were other clubs spawned out of Studio 54 for the people that couldn't actually get into Studio 54. So there were other clubs like The Loft and then up in, um, I think it was Chicago, The Warehouse, Paradise Garage. So I, th I think The Warehouse was New York, but I think Paradise Garage, um, used to uh, take DJs from the warehouse, which would have been uh, Ron Harding, which is like one of the old classic DJs that used to buy two copies of the record. So he could make long loops of the best bits of the records. And that's really sort of how the whole DJing culture sort of started. And that's what spawned the clubs because um back then a lot of the clubs were gay clubs like it was the only place that people could go and be free and dance and no one really cared who you were what you were doing everybody was just there to have a good time and listen to really good music <laughs> So where I liked a lot of different music and was listening to a lot of different music, I think in my history of listening to a bit of disco, um, then all of a sudden come a re-release um, of Donna Summer's I Feel Love by Giorgio Moroder. So he done a version of it and that record to me just like that, you know, for my ears, that was like everything I was listening to, the electro and like all the synthy stuff, like, you know, the craft work, and that rolled into one. So Giorgio Moroder had a lot of influence to me on what he was doing with electronic music, and that sound of um, the remix he done in Donna Summer I Feel Love with the arpeggiated um, synth. That, I don't know, that done something to me and to this day I still play that record and love that record. That's probably, you know, in my all time top 10 records because 
there's not actually a lot to it, but the groove, like it just makes you want to move. That's one track that I wish I'd have written because that to me kind of wraps up the whole electronic disco, the vibe, you know, just a simple vocal line over it. And that's really the spawn of kind of dance music, you know, a simple rhythm, a vocal on it, not a lot going on, just the groove, just the, you know, a constant drum and the groove. And to me, that was the kind of changing point of how I listen to music. So as you can hear, I've made a couple of goes at doing disco tracks, and I've also um, done a disco track um, more recently with the Delicate Giants. But disco has always influenced like the house music that I've made. Um, like it's always weaved itself in and out through my career in music. So. I've always got to give a big shout out for Disco, really.
So that was a delicate giant, me, Gary and Dean doing a disco track. Now we all like disco, that was within our era of music. So like we thought we'd knock out a disco track just for some fun and something different from the Delicate Giants. As next year will be some different stuff coming out from the Delicate Giants. So I couldn't move forward without including rap into the equation because as I was listening to a lot of different albums, I was still listening to a lot of hip hop and rap music. So here's uh, a selection of some of the artists that I would listen to at the same time as listening to all them other bands. same time that you had clubs like Paradise Garage um, and Ron Harding playing different kinds of music, like at the same time in Europe uh, you had um, some from Belgium, Germany, there was a new beat which was a sound that was coming out which was more like a kind of forerunner for techno it was a bit industrial at the same time over in the states you had um detroit was you know everybody was losing their jobs and the city was getting run down so you had people like one atkins that were doing um like a dark symphony you know drum machine based like electronic keyboard sounds to reflect the sort of dark area that was going on. And then in Chicago, you had um, people that were starting to make music to to fit to uh, these clubs, Paradise Garage and stuff. And that's when like people like DJ Pierre, they were going out and they were buying cheap, electronic instruments that they could find and the instruments that they were buying was stuff like the Roland 808 drum machine, the Roland TB303 bass line which was meant to make a bass sound but never really made it and it wasn't until one day they were sitting there twiddling about with a sound over a drum machine that suddenly like acid was born and that sound just 
totally took everything by storm. That drum machine as an initial bass line was being used in some records like um, Shalimar were using them. Um, there was a few other bands that had found the actual bass sound, but no one was twiddling all the knobs on the machine. And at the same time, the music scene was very sort of bohemian, like in Ibiza at the time. And there was lots of um, sort of what they call a Balearic sound, which was a mixture of Spanish guitar and gentle drum beats, like just a sort of slow groove at sort of 114 BPM sort of tempo. And then like stuff like the electro and the Detroit stuff, that was all much quicker, sort of 125, 128 BPM. And then like the classic acid sound come out and that really was a turning point for electronic music as we know it today.
So then what happened was uh, there was a DJ called Trevor Fung who was playing in bars and a few clubs in Ibiza and a few of his, his friends got together. Um, that was Paul Oakenfold, Johnny Walker, Danny Ramplin and Nicky Holloway. So they all went on a holiday to Ibiza because they heard um, that there was a good scene going on and everybody was having a good time. And, you know, they, was, he, they were all told about the DJ that was playing uh, Amnesia. So this Alfonso, so he, or Alfredo, uh, his name. It, so this club, if you call it a club, in its early days, was just a farm in Ibiza that used to play music and it got more and more popular and now it's kind of world famous. So Amnesia built up its name over the years. The other thing that was going on with these lads, when they got to this place, everybody seemed to be having such a good time and the DJ was playing a complete different mixture of music and he was playing the music from Chicago and Detroit and you know this new acid house um, or this acid sound and mixing it up with you know like Cindy Lauper and stuff like this and they couldn't quite get it until someone offered them these little pills which turned out to be ecstasy and then that completely changed everything they had like the best night of their lives and everybody was just hugging one another everyone was just feeling the vibe of the music so then what happened was um paul oakenfold come back to london and he started a, a club called spectrum which turned into future and that was at uh, the uh, uh, Heaven um, Club and that was in Charing Cross Road and that would later come on to be a very famous club that turned into something else but that used to be on a Monday night so it was cheap to rent out a club on the Monday because who wanted to go out on the Monday but the buzz built about this club and ecstasy was starting to come into London and people were taking it and you know they was going out having a good time the music suited because the tempo of the music was about 120 bpm which is twice your heart rate so it's it's that foundation of the beat that gets you moving um, because uh, it was well, believed that clubs like Future that were on a Monday and you know everybody was having a happy Monday and that's how the band Happy Mondays got their name that's a kind of big rumour you also had uh, the club The Trip which was run by Nicky Holloway at the Astoria that was also um, in between Charing Cross and Oxford Street that was a big club um, the Astoria live bands play there and stuff and the, he used to rent that out and that started to get more and more popular and Danny Ramplin started a club called Shoom and the reason it's called Shoom is because when he took ecstasy he had like a Shoom feeling come over him so he took that name and he started up a club in South uh, London and them three guys along with um, Trevor Fung was playing stuff and incidentally Trevor Fung is my probably all time favourite DJ because he listened to a lot of music and he mixes a lot of music and he always plays music with a good groove. That's what I've always loved about Trevor Fung. So these guys really started off the 
house, techno, and what become known as acid house, it wasn't because people were particularly taking acid, it was just a term for, you know, the music. So, so all that sort of feeling that you get, oh, acid, you know, and dropping LSD, yes, people were doing that, but that wasn't the main reason and why it's called acid house music. It's just the term acid house music. So the sound of the Roland TB303 is, I think, a lot of people that make music must know what one of them machines is. It's kind of the real classic sound, that real bass line sound. It was used together with the 808 drum machine and then they slightly later on released a 909 drum machine um, from Roland. And that in dance music was a real game changer. But the 303 um, really spawned that whole, you know, freedom, let loose, let you, you know, you mute the music in burst your body, you know, like, you know, that sound, that sort of constant sound that used to change was really all to do with one of these little boxes. So this little box was a game changer in dance music history. So this is a real, oh, I mean, it is a piece of history. Like these machines, you know, were throwaway items that could be picked up for, you know, $50, $100 back then. And I think even at the time in sort of 1990, 
bit earlier on 1989 when I got this one this was I paid a hundred pounds for it so it's gone up in value and it's been a good investment and you know I still love the sound of a 303 I can't say that I don't it gets used in so much music it just creates that undertone line that is you know moving because because of the way that it is the dials on the actual machine you know are made to be turned well they wasn't made to be turned but once you started turning them um the you know the cut off and the resonance and the envelope mod on it it just really sent it wild and i think the first time I ever heard an acid track was when I walked into a club in 1987. It was in, I was in Tenerife, which is a Spanish island, but it's on the other side of Africa, not actual um, Ibiza. And they were playing future acid tracks. And that actual, pattern of acid tracks is actually being used and I'll demonstrate later on a more modern version you know that Jimmy Audio done for the iPad so it's it's kind of serendipity that you know all them years ago I was listening to this sound in the club and now it's available for me on my iPad and it's been in a few different you know incarnations that from the ipad it's a sound that everybody want you know who does dance music uses and the 808 909 the 303 are probably the biggest drum machines and bass line and when techno music was being done there was like the TR727s and stuff like that the more percussive sounds that that started and again it, that was only because they were the forerunner drum machines that people were getting hold of and doing dance music so the sound you know it, it evolved from them drum machines and they've always been used and you know these have been emulated by many different companies. Um, there's lots of clones around for this machine and it's a classic machine. It's a shame I can't fire it up for you because I don't know where the power supply is for it um, and I can't search my cupboards to, to find it. But um, yeah, definitely this machine is the game changer. So as more and more people were going to these parties, more and more parties started to pop up and everyone was playing the music that was getting so popular because of the rise of the drug ecstasy. So lots of clubs were now doing like rave nights, like house music, techno and this become very popular very fast there was more DJs 
more clubs opening, doing this sort of stuff. Uh, and then, of course, the more people you got coming, the bigger the venues you need. So people were starting up pirate radio stations. We had radio stations that were playing the music all day that the people loved that they was going out to at the weekends. So a whole culture come around the pirate radio stations and they had a lot of power because they were telling people where all these parties were. So they were making money from the promoters paying them to say, oh, my party's on at so and so this weekend. So then it got so big that they had to come up with, you know, telephone numbers that you could ring and meeting points and the rays went into warehouses. So what was happening were well, people were breaking into warehouses and putting on these big illegal raves. They were shipping in the sound system, putting the party on and realizing, charging, you know, five pound, 10 pound for, for people to come in. And when you've got like 20,000 people turning it up to your party, that's a lot of cash. So they started, putting better sound systems in, better lasers, better lighting to attract people. And you had a few big companies doing this all at the same time. Um, there was the Energy and Sunrise and um, Genesis, which was um, primarily put on by a guy called Wayne Anthony. And like he had the balls to you know, dress up smart, get a clipboard, and go and tell the police when they turned up that it was a licensed venue and they were doing a shoot for Madonna or whoever, you know? So he was just blagging it to the full to keep the authorities off them. And as these parties got bigger and bigger, you couldn't, there were so many people turning up to the warehouse parties it then turned into they were looking around and paying farmers to do parties in their fields and stuff and that's when the whole m25 scene come into play and you'd have people on a saturday night like listening for the meeting point which would probably be a service station on the m25 that would be a meeting rally point so you drive there and there would be some guy there saying, follow me. And he would then lead off this big, long convoy of cars and nobody wanted to be, you know, missing the convoy. So you went through red lights, you'd done whatever you had to do. There was just car after car after car going at these venues, turning up to some field somewhere and then there'd be a big sound system set up with all the lasers and all the lighting. And this really become known, this happened from the end of 88 to the start of 1989. And as it started to get bigger, people were doing more music. I was buying lots of records of all this classic house music. Um, and I was starting to play at little free parties and do other little parties and DJing and but the whole thing turned itself over because the more people wanted to go out the more music was made the more the promoters could see that there was you know they was earning good money at this and um, you know that's how raving really escalated quick from the end of 1988 with these guys coming back you know with this sound from Ibiza to like being up and down the country you had people um, like the Hacienda in Manchester was opening up playing this sort of music and that was feeding all the um, people up in the north of the country this sound and the artists that were coming out of there so you had like a guy called Gerald and Stone Roses, Happy Mondays. So all these guys were getting spawned at the same time. 
the London scene was massive and there was a lot of dance parties going on everywhere and you know pretty much all weekend you would go out on a Friday night and you know maybe come on Sunday afternoon that was how these parties went and that's you know not just me that's thousands of people doing this at the weekends and you know everybody was going out having a good time no one was fighting no one was drinking like it was called the summer of love <laughs>
So that video gives you a glimpse of what it actually used to be like. That was what the parties were like. You know, you had lots of people in fields, like the police trying to stop it. And they were really powerless to do anything because there was like, you know, 40, 50,000 people at these places. And that was just one rave in one place and there were several of these going on up and down the country because you know partly there was people were in the partying and partly because people were earning lots of money doing this at the same time the there's a really good book by a guy uh, who used to put on these parties wayne anthony which is this the class of 88 and it describes his kind of life going on putting these parties on and you know what he was doing that to get these raves going the flags he was doing the money he was making the criminal element that was getting involved and trying to take over what he was doing because you know there was a lot more money to be made at a rave on a Saturday night selling ecstasy and charging £10 to get in than people going out and robbing banks. So, you know, it was easy cash and there was a lot of it floating around. So they were, you know, there was an edge to it, but it was, it had quietened down, um, where there was a lot of football violence in the 80s like between sort of West Ham and Millwall so South and East London um, used to rival each other but they were making so much money at these parties they were just happy to help each other out and getting on with everything and you know everybody loved each other you know like one minute they were fighting and the next minute they were making lots of money and you know, doing deals with each other, so it kind of all turns around. So every Thursday night, there was a club at the uh, Arches at Charing Cross, which was called, um, the club was called Heaven and the night was called Rage. And this is back where um, there was an upstairs and downstairs to this club. And you had DJs like Trevor Fung, Colin Favour, Colin Dow, um, Groove Rider, Fabio, Jumping Jack Frost. So there was all these DJs playing at this club. Now my work diary from 1989, considering this was a Thursday night, every Friday in that diary, I had the day off, was sick, on holiday. I didn't go to work on any Friday during 1989 because that was the start of the rave weekend. You know, you'd go, I would religiously go to rage on the Thursday night. And I went there for quite a few years. Every Thursday, it was just like, oh, who's coming to rage? And like me and one other person or 10 other people would go and party at rage. Um, that was really the beginning of the weekend for clubbing and then on a Saturday you'd have a big rave and then 
Monday you'd be back to work again. So that was footage of inside Rage, what it actually looks like. It's not a massive, massive club. Like I say, it had a 
a room upstairs with DJs playing and then a room downstairs. And two DJs, Fabio and Groove Rider, used to play upstairs. And they got quite popular because they were speeding up hip hop breaks under techno records. So eventually they come downstairs to the main floor and like people liked their sound that they was doing. And where they were creating, you know, faster breakbeaty stuff under techno records and um, people like Goldie used to come down to the club. So the club had a really big following, like a lot of people that were making music were going to this club. And from there, like from the breakbeat stuff turned into drum and bass and that's where drum and bass originated. It was firstly called jungle music and that was popular and then it turned into like drum and bass as you know it today so so i was able to see like the whole evolution of like the chicago house music the acid music turning into the drum and bass and what we have today and then that's what spawned ambient kind of music on chill music because People were going out clubbing and they weren't finished coming down from their drugs yet and they just wanted to still listen to music but you know they wanted to sit down and listen to music so so a whole other scene of music was born out of that and that's where you get you know this ambient stuff and like the chill stuff and you know I think there was tracks like little fluffy clouds and stuff that were were made using all these electronic sounds but without the big heavy kick drums in it. it you know you just wanted to sit down and everything was back down to sort of 60 bpm keep your heart rate slow so so that's how a lot of music was just spawned out of just going out clubbing and coming back and still wanting to continue and you used to have after parties and eventually a lot of clubs started to have actual chill out rooms because they realised people were coming down off their drugs and they needed somewhere to sit down, cool down, you know, just drink a bottle of water and, and relax. So, so that become a big thing as well in musical history because it spawned all this slower downbeat kind of music that you get today.
lots of stars at night. So now I was starting to DJ a few parties like Spiral Tribe and there was every time I was playing records I could always hear something else in the record oh if it just had this sound oh if it just had this little sound so I had no clue how to make music so it started for me by buying a DJ mixer with um, a sampler built in. It was a Newmark mixer. And they was probably about 800 pound UK at the time. So they wasn't a cheap little mixer. And I was now, I've been working. So like I saved up and I bought one of these mixers. So it wasn't until I come home from clubbing one night and I was laying in my bed and it was probably three o'clock in the morning and I wanna say I think the show was called The Hitman and Her and I was watching this um this TV show and all of a sudden it come on one of these rave tunes that I used to go out of the weekend and love and it like I never knew who it was I just you know used to hear the music and DJs at the time wasn't too keen on letting you know what records I had because you know that was how they was earning money to have something exclusive so this record come on and it was Pacific um by 808 state so it's i think it's called pacific 303 or pacific origins is the version i like and i i like i woke up out of you know half being asleep and i was like pinned to my tv set and i was like what equipment are they using now they're making this stuff and like so that was the first thing that really sparked me into wanting to make music was you know i could hear these sounds in my head but i i didn't have a clue how they were making them and it wasn't until i see this live act like i say 808 state doing this track that i was like ah oh, wow and i had a record uh, not a record shop a music shop you know not that far from me like probably quarter of a mile half a mile and the very next day, I was straight down to the music store. When I went down to this music store, I had written down the name of all that I could see on this stage. And, you know, there was probably a Juno 106, a TB303. And I recognised this, an SH101. And I was like, okay, I want an SH101. That's the keyboard that must make this sort of acid sound, like this dance stuff. So my first foray into music was buying this little mono synth, this SH101, which is a great little keyboard actually. Um, 
I didn't know how to sequence it up or what to do with it. I was just plugging it in my mixer and getting sounds out of it. I didn't have a clue what to do with it. But this was my start in music. This is the very first piece of equipment that I bought. So a mutual friend of mine that I've known since he was probably five years old, like I was taking him to Rage and he was a little bit younger than me, but I knew the bouncers there. So, you know, I used to get him in every week. And he said, oh, I've got this guy who works at, well, didn't work, he's, he's in the same year as him at college. So he said, like he does a bit of music, so I was like, oh yeah, and you're like, can you ask him how you would get this keyboard to like, you know, like make a sequence, you know, it, I had the the onboard sequencer of the SH101, but I didn't know what to do, how to get it all in time. And so we had a meeting at the Brain Club up in Wardour Street in London and I met him and we talked about music and he, at the time, was running his Atari and Pro 24. So that was then give me the spark. Okay, right, so I need an Atari and like Pro 24. And he was like, oh, he said, I might be able to get hold of this program called Cubase that's, uh, you know, a, better version of this so he said we just need a 1040 Atari to run it on so so that was we mutually in one conversation both had the same idea as making music and he was already sequencing stuff on his Pro 24 and he come round to my house and set all this stuff up and actually showed me how it was working and how you could play sang and it would obviously the midi was recording and then playing it back and the sound was coming back which just totally blew me away i was like right this is what i want to be doing so at the time i was still working a regular job i was working for chub alarms fitting in burger alarms and like I was making a apprentice, I was an apprentice. I wasn't making great money, but like all the money that I had that I was buying records with, I started to save up so we could buy keyboards. So I think it was an Alesis drum machine that we got, um, a cool game one. Um, and a Roland Juno 2 because these items oh we also had a um a Casio um VZ rack map unit synth and this had the magic MIDI connection which I obviously didn't know anything about but you know we as musicians kind of know about what MIDI does and like how you play your keys to your iPad or you know your PC or your Apple Mac or whatever so that was a start of now being able to do MIDI and connect this stuff up so 
that was something that my friend was already knew about. So like I jumped straight in at, you know, the go flag really, because I didn't have to do all the looking and reading up and figuring it all out. He already knew all this stuff. So that made putting our first record together a little bit easier. And um, I've still got, um, surprise, surprise, I've still got the um, Atari that allowed the sequencing. And it come with this little connector on it, which was a MIDI out and that was the key and I haven't even looked but I'm guessing maybe <laughs> yeah so there on floppy disk is my original version of Cubase that I used to write all my music with so you know and I managed to get this computer because I was doing a job fitting an alarm in a shop that just started selling these Ataris and I was able to get a manager's discount on this so I didn't hesitate I bought this because this was the heart of like the being able to control all the MIDI so it was a no-brainer like I didn't I think I bought one game for it, which was like Chase HQ or something. And then I never played another game on it again. This was solely sat in the studio being a workhorse for years, you know? So although it's only the 520, it's got the upgrade in it. So, so yeah, that's, uh, you know, the start of my musical origins and, you know, the, parts of the equipment that I was using to now do this. By this time, there was a lot of piano driven music and like the piano, which was the M1 sound, was a major part of house music and dance music. So our first kind of endeavor into doing and releasing stuff come, um, and we called ourselves Simpty because when we was actually at the recording studios, the guy asked us what our band name was, and we just sort of looked around the room and they had this bit of equipment for syncing up um, video and music, and it, it just had Simpty written on the front. So we was like, oh yeah, we're called Simpty. So that's how that all come about, and we've, the limited keyboards and stuff that we had, like we made and pressed up and sold our first record.
So having left my job and getting the final piece of the music jigsaw puzzle put together, which was a sampler, we then carried on making music. Um, my friend dropped out of college, I'd left work. So we now set up, uh, while well, I was renting the room that we put a studio in, and I had my record decks in there and all the keyboards, and like we just started making music. And you know, that's how it started for us. We, we carried on and we put out another couple of records. We went back with this Horace Wanted hardcore record and like this, these other hardcore records that actually sold okay, you know, like the radio stations were playing them and like, so we, we had fairly instant success in the way of what people were playing for us and we was getting played on the radio station KISS FM which was like a bigger London radio station as well as some of the little pirates and they was using our music for advertising raves and stuff so so it gave us a motivation to carry on and that's what we done we carried on working on music and um, but we made a couple of the tracks but that's really how I did start, you know, making music for a living. That was the turning point. now making music regularly but you know as everything as you know now it's hard to get your music out there and get listened to so we were working with a couple of other people and like some DJs and then one day um, a mutual friend said oh my mate wants to make a record like can he come round to yours and put one together so I was like yeah sure so he come round, he brought a load of records, want to sample this, a sample that, a sample this, we put it together. And he brought this guy around with him called Matt. And but uh, you know, he was interested in what we was doing and he was a DJ himself. So I think the following week he rung me up and he was like, oh hello, this is Matt. I come round last week with Paul. Um, like I'm really interested in doing something for myself. Now, Matt was playing in a few clubs uptown. Um, the, I think it was the Milk Bar and like, some other clubs. I think Ministry of Sound that just sort of opened up. Um, so, like, we was like, yeah, sure, come round. And like after making a test pressing together, we'd done this track and we played it at Ministry of Sound and that seemed to go quite well. We made another um, test pressing or a, like a dub plate they're called actually, like it's a one-off pressing. And that seemed to do quite well in the club. So we talked amongst ourselves and said, look, why don't we set up a record label and do this stuff ourselves, you know? like. You know, we can make the music. Um, like you can go out there and see if it's working or not, and we should know what's what's good for the dance floor. So that was it. There was myself, Kevin, and Matt, and we started 
our record company, SCR, um, we started making music. And the first record we made together, again, was getting airplay on KISS FM. And then the second record we made, we had a guy called Hugh Pryor phone us up, who was working for a company called Pop Promotions. And he said, look, come up here, come and see us. Like, we want to talk to you about your record. And we went up and see him and like, it was up in North London. It was quite a way away. But we went and see him and he said, look, we like the stuff you're doing. Like a DJ, like actually passed us one of your records and said, oh, look, these guys are pretty good. Like you should have a listen. So my phone number was on the record label or fax number as it was then. And he um, just said to us, look, I'll put your records in with the mailers that we're sending out to other DJs and we'll just put your record in, you know, you just give us the records for free and we'll send them out. We won't charge it for the promotion, like we're just piggyback like the bigger companies that were paying for the promotion. So like it seemed like a good idea to me and um, and that's how it all started with SCR and that's what got us popular. We was getting straight in the letterboxes of the actual DJs and we ended up with a big kind of mailing list of all these DJs that were reviewing the stuff in magazines and playing it in the clubs, playing it on their little local radio stations. And, you know, the three of us just went at it full time. And, you know, that's all we've done. We've invested money back into the studio, built more equipment, you know, JD800 and uh, the Kurtzwall K2000 and like noise gates and effect units and like mixing desk and so that's how my kind of evolution waved itself into music that's why I come in from a dance music angle and that's why I love dance music that will always be my first love now obviously I'd like to play some different stuff in the different sort of styles of, that I've made and like show you some records that I've made and just some various bits of music now. Let's see if I can do this shit, shall we? All right. I haven't tried this since I've had my stroke, so it should be interesting.
think goes so bad. <laughs> a few off moments, but on the whole, not too bad. If I grabbed a microphone, wouldn't it? I'm used to having a headset. Wow, pretty pretty cool stuff, huh? <laughs> pretty impressive stuff. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Russ for uh, trusting me to host this uh, little documentary that he put together. He reached out to me as usual and said he was putting this together. And um, you know, here's the thing: he actually said he, he was putting it together. I think more so to document, you know, his history and stuff. And which I think it's a really good idea for somebody who's had such a career as Russ. Um, uh, you know, I, we all love Russ so much. But one of the things that he said was he wanted to give me a day off. So not only was he like making a video uh, to show you guys about who he is and how he got to where he was and the music that has influenced him, he put together the video so I could have a day off. And kick back and, and relax and listen to my favorite style of music. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you all enjoyed it as much as I did. It's, what a fantastic uh, documentary. And I'm sure you're all going to want to see part two that I know he is putting together. So next year we'll uh, bring that to you guys. And um, he's, I know he is working on a part two. And you've got to give him kudos. The guy's had a stroke, right? He can only use one arm. And he put together that whole video, putting up the green screen, putting together all that video footage, and then DJing at the end. If that's not inspiring for you, I don't know what will be. Um, and lastly, I want to thank Russ again for... Uh, doing that, putting it together, allowing me to play it here on my channel. And I'm sure everybody wants to see a part two. So we'll probably be heading into the iOS era of Russ in part two, I do believe. Um, and, uh, yeah, the timing was right. It was, it was, I wanted to have this on yesterday, but unfortunately things happened that uh, couldn't be sorted. And uh, look, I want to go out today just by letting you all know that um, I want to thank you all for supporting this channel and supporting things like this because I know it's called How to App on iOS, but I want to continue to have a varied uh, collection of things on this channel because it's not just about buying apps, you know. It's about the people who, who make music, what they do with apps, how they work together with other people, their stories. This channel is so much more than that, and I really want it in 2023 to be so much more than that. Um, so next year, I can promise you, I'm going to finally release the movie I've been working on for six years. <laughs> it's coming. And maybe even a documentary like that about my stuff. So, But finally, I just want to say uh, I want to thank Russ for putting that together because if anything, out of all the rough stuff that I've gone through in the, uh, and still am going through, the one thing that uh, Russ has proven to me today by watching that is to keep fighting. To keep fighting whatever comes in your way. Don't give up. Just keep doing what you love doing. And I, I'm going to sign off today and let you all go and get on with your day. And uh, say those magic words. Remember, folks, do the things that make you happy. Mistakes make you better. And we'll all rise together. I'll see you tomorrow on the Patreon, everybody. for The Christmas Patreon with lots of giveaways. And maybe Gladys. Depends on how I'm feeling. It may change. We'll see. See you tomorrow. We'll all rise together Cause you make me shine better And we'll all rise together You make me shine better
the night is cold and lonely, we all shine together.